He's the founder at U Lesson, the founder and the former CEO at Conga. He's a technology entrepreneur. Hello, Mr. Shagaya. Good to have you on the program. Really good to be here with you, Nancy. How are you doing today? Doing very well, thank you. Now, let's talk about education. This is one sector which you are going into. I know, or which you've gone into. <laughs> I know you are, you know, an innovator. You founded Conga Deal Day, I guess. Yes, if I'm not mistaken. You know, and now the other project is you lesson, so education. And it seems that during this pandemic is, or perhaps a, a little before the pandemic was when you entered this sector with you lesson. Now speak to me about what you've been able to gather, how far we have, we have come as a country in our educational system, especially during this lockdown till now. How have we fared? Well, I, I think um, historically, um, well, you, you can answer the question in two parts. On the, on, the, on the one hand, families and parents and learners have shown um, that there's a lot of demand for quality educational services. You know, Nancy, in our society, education is um, the, the one means that those in um, the middle class and below see for, um, for social mobility, for moving up, upward. So there's a lot of demand there. But historically, we haven't made a lot of investments, um, especially on the, on the public side um, in education, whether that's, you know, nursery school to SS3, K through 12, as it's commonly called, or whether that's on the tertiary side. Um, but the private sector has really stepped in. What we've seen over the past um, 10 years is, is private schools have taken off. There's a willingness, not just in the upper class or the middle class, but also in the lower class to send children to schools that are private schools. So enrollment in the private schools has really, really taken off. Now, with that in mind, Nancy, um, when you talk about COVID, this, of course, has caused massive social disruption. Kids are not able to go to school. Schools are closed, and for good reason. Um, we hadn't, whether on the public or the private side, made sufficient investments in information technology. So a lot of us, a lot of the schools and learners and families were caught flat-footed. Um, but since this pandemic has, um, has, um, has disrupted uh, uh, social activity so, so pervasively, what we've seen is that there's an increased willingness now um, on the parts of schools and educators and families and learners to uh, adopt uh, um, services and devices that would allow for, um, uh, for e-learning to happen. Mm. You know, what the pandemic, what COVID-19 pandemic has also uh, told us is that it has exposed the educational inequality in the country. Um, Nigeria contributes approximately about 20% of the total global out-of-school population. We have a lot of out-of-school children. I think the last count that I have is about 13.5. It increased from 10.5 to 13.5. So the question right now is that how do we close that digital, uh, how do we close that in inequality? Not even talking about digitally, or can we even close it with a digital model? Absolutely, absolutely. Digital will play a very big role in, in closing that divide. Um, digital will not replace schools. Mm -hmm. Digital will not replace um, teachers. You know, schools fulfill many functions, um, whether that it's content dissemination or, you know, tests and assessments. Um, but they also fulfill the function of socialization and sports and allow parents to go and be productive in the workforce. But what we found is that we have massive deficiencies in um, the number of teachers, in teacher quality, so digital is going to play a big role in that. I think that there, there's, you know, a couple of very clear things that can be done um, on the public side, on government side, um, whether that's through regulation or through um, um, direct investment that can really drive digital. I think as a matter of urgency, um, every school in the tier one and tier two cities of Nigeria should be connected to the internet and whether that's a public school or a private school. And I do think government can have a massive role to play. You see, the internet, and then to some degree also devices, they are like the foundation. Once you lay this foundation, then companies like ULESSON can start to layer on services that can really improve learning outcomes 
improve the financial health of schools, allow them to do much, much more with less. You know, we have basically built a service that takes some of the best teachers in our country and, um, and allows us to basically present content in physics and mathematics and chemistry and biology, basic science, business studies, and make that available to schools and to families and learners. Um, in order for us to push that content through, this foundation of internet to schools and devices through to schools must be laid. Once that foundation is laid, then folks like us can start to put these rich services into schools. There is no reason that we as a society, again, whether it's on the public side, government, or on the private side, should have to invest as much as other societies, say in the Northern Hemisphere, in the West, mm. have invested. We can do so much more in a much more capital efficient manner, Nancy. You know, you, you're saying quite a lot of things. And when you're talking about investment, especially around infrastructure, to enable guys like you and other entrepreneurs going to that sector and, you know, with what you're doing right now, what comes to my mind is that can, can that be achieved? And if it can, how quickly? Because it seems the pandemic caught everyone unawares and it worsened yes. our educational system. In fact, uh, I don't even know if we have a learning crisis right now. But if you take a look at it, we may have. Because for those yes. that have been able to adopt the digital system or the digital way of learning at this time, it's perhaps for folks, for parents that have the money. A rural, a person in the rural place right now, a rural schoolboy, has not even seen what a computer is. And he's telling the person mm -hmm. to come and study. You know, so, mm -hmm. so how can that gap be filled quickly, especially in an environment where the economy is supposed to be in a recession if we continue this downward trend, and where the government is also lacking money? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, there are a couple of things that are happening that give me a lot of optimism at the same time. First of all, there are progressive states like Lagos. Lagos, um, I think it's called the, Unify, the Unified Fiber Duct Project mm -hmm. or something like that, but Lagos is basically um, undertaking an ambitious project to lay fiber to every single local government and every single ward of that state. That's the kind of effort we need to see nationwide. But that said, you're absolutely right. The internet is still expensive. Look, Nancy, it's gotten cheaper, but it's still expensive. You know, five, six years ago, the cost of internet to a household in Nigeria was 12.5% of household income. That's a lot of money, 12.5% of household income going to just data. That number has now dropped. I think we're now in the 6 to 7% range. But we're certainly not in the 2% range of Asia. So the cost of broadband needs to go down. And there are several things that the government and the regulator, the NCC, can do. I know, as a matter of fact, that there are telcos that are willing to offer cheaper data services to educational institutions, for instance. But there is a floor set on how much they can charge. They can't go below a certain rate. Now in Nigeria, you get one gigabyte rate, uh, you get one gigabyte of data for about 300 naira to about 1,000 naira, depending on the plan that you pick. In Ghana, you can find operators that are offering one gigabyte of data for the equivalent of 93 naira. And this is just by regulation. There's nothing government has to do there. So that floor needs to be lowered, especially in the context of, um, of education, especially for that sector. Um, then, of course, there's devices. You mentioned devices. There are kids in a rural area that have not seen a laptop, not seen a computer. And in this age, in 2020, that really is a travesty. This computer, these devices, these smartphones and these tablets, they are not just tools of entertainment. They are, they are tools that basically allow us to push rich educational services into the nooks and crannies of this country. So the, the cost of these devices are dropping. We're finally starting to see devices that are sufficiently powerful that are coming in at under 20,000 Naira. In my mind, once you get below that 20,000 Naira range for a device that is sufficiently powerful, not something that will just fall apart and break, but something that is actually durable, and then that device can be financed over the course of a year, then you've hit a magic point in my mind. You've basically hit that tipping point where 
the internet and the devices can begin to flow into the nooks and crannies of the society and enable all of these services. So it's really critical, I think, that every policy and every investment with respect to this be made towards achieving those two goals, lowering that cost of data so we can achieve parity with countries like Ghana and even go lower. And then on the other hand, getting cheap devices into the hands of um, learners. Mm. We need to be aspiring to a world ultimately, and I know it's going to take a while, but this is the vision we should have of one device to one child in the hands of kids, mm. whether they're in private school or public school. You know, uh, Sim, you actually hit a nerve there. And what you actually said that hits me is not just having about cheap devices, but cheap and durable devices, not something that would just bring. I thought I was the only one that was noticing that, you know, in terms <laughs> of, <laughs> you know, you, you see even devices that are more expensive than the 20,000 Naira now. And when a child or a kid just holds it in the next like one month it's broken and you can fix it. So I was actually wondering, yep. is it um, about handling or so? But with what you said now, you've actually put in some kind of perspectives to it that it shouldn't just be only cheap, it should also be durable. If we want to achieve that one child, one device uh, strategy. Good one there. Yeah. Now, le le let's yeah. talk about perhaps a, a, the learning model that we suit our localized system. And I chose my word very well, our localized system. That's like a Nigerianized learning model if I should put it like that, because w when, I, when I took a look at the U.S., for example, three quarters of the 50 largest school districts have decided to start the school year remotely as a result of continued infections. And in Nigeria, we're seeing continued infections. Parents are still skeptical of even sending their children back to school. What kind of learning yeah. models should we have? Should we just stick with remote or we should do the hybrid model? That's the mixture of both for the benefit <laughs> of my viewers. Yes, no, that's a really good question. And your observation is really on point. This pandemic, you know, it's starting to look like it's going to be with us into next year. Um, and even if a vaccine comes, it looks like it might linger for a while. Um, you know, certain states in Nigeria are trying to open up those schools. Um, Ghana has decided to open schools up, I think, in January next year. Um, and those experiments, I think, you know, while they are well-meaning, we also have to be careful because we've seen attempts at reopening in the West that have not ended up well. So that said, what does learning look like in the context of our infrastructure deficiencies and all of these deficiencies we currently have? We have to deal with the reality we have. Now, this is where I'm really proud about what we've built at U-Lesson, for instance. The solution that we're providing to schools and parents can be used entirely offline. That means that you can learn very richly. So what do I mean by richly? If a kid is, for instance, in senior secondary and they are learning about Newtonian physics, they are learning about Newton's first law of motion, your lesson allows that kid to not only see a really good teacher teaching them, but rich animation that can demonstrate the third law of motion in a way that really sinks in and then goes further and then pushes assessments so that that kid can take quizzes, that child can take quizzes and assessments that basically allow them to know how they're progressing. I think right now with where we are, this sort of offline approach is very critical to what we need to do. Now, I also think that some sort of intervention from other adults will always be important. In the absence of that, the offline approach like ULESSON has built, I think, is really, really critical. But you will need that, um, that intervention always. When we think about the teachers that mean a lot to us, that teacher that really made us believe in ourselves, we never really remember them necessarily because of the academics, strictly, but because of how much they believed in us. So I do think that you do need that hybrid approach. Um, and this is what goes back to what I was saying before, that schools... And I think in the future, private schools will play a very huge role in, um, in uh, educating the population where the public system has not done as well. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That should be allowed to happen. Um, but those private schools will find that they will struggle if they do not make investments in digital infrastructure and technology. But Sim, Over the first Sim hold on. It would also disenfranchise a lot of our children that are in public schools, you know, uh, 
it would disenfranchise a lot of people. We have 13.5 million people out of school. Even some uh, private schools are struggling as we speak. Yes. Right? And because it's no, it's a crisis. You're absolutely right. 13.5 million kids out of school is unacceptable. It is no less than a crisis without being dramatic. Something has to be done about that. But I do think that we are, like I mentioned, if we are not there in 2020, I think by the end of 2021, these things are happening right now. The world is making massive innovations in devices that are driving down costs. Internet can be cheaper, even right now in Nigeria, without investment, just because of regulation, internet can be cheaper. We can start to get into the public schools, at least in the tier two cities, in the capital cities. You know, adoption of technology is something that's gradual. The first technologies are always adopted by the wealthy, and then they make their way into, you know, I, you will remember, you know, what we Nigerians popularly call, you know, not nine not, not, yes. not, not nine yeah. not. Yes, zero nine zero, mm -hmm. the first analog phones. Those were only available for the super wealthy in Nigeria. They had subscriptions of 20,000, 30,000 people across all of Nigeria. Now you have a country with, you know, 100 million phone lines. So this is what's going to happen. I think by deliberate, conscious efforts on, uh, by government on the part of um, um, broadband and devices, we can, in the very short term, get into at least the tier two cities, the capital cities, and some states have more than one you know, tier two city. And then over the years, start to push into the rural areas. This is something that can be done right now. Okay, Sam, in your own honest opinion, and take off your entrepreneur hat, take off your, your capitalist hat for a second, and honestly answer this for me. If you think our schools should reopen fully, uh, Kenya announced just a few uh, time ago that their schools will remain close to 2021. In fact, in Philippines, the government announced that the schools will be reopened until a vaccine is developed. So with your off-capitalist hat, do you think that we should fully reopen schools, apart from the exit classes that are open that we've seen, with continued rising in, in infections? Look, I mean, I think the this, this simple answer to that, if, if what we're optimizing for here is public health, and if we're observing what has happened in other societies, there are examples, I think University of North Carolina in the United States opened, and then within a couple of weeks, they saw a surge in infections, then the answer would be no. But I know that on a school-by-school -school basis, on a state-by-state -state basis, on a local government-by-local government, local government basis, there are policies that can be put in place if the, um, there are policies that can be put in place that can allow for um, schools to be open, whether that is reducing the density of students, so a certain class attends on Mondays and Wednesdays and another attends on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, whether that is enforcing social distancing and masks and things like that. And I know, Nancy, you're also asking a question about our culture and our willingness to adhere to some of these protocols, these public health protocols like masks and social distancing. Empirically, just what I mean by that is just observing what has happened so far. We haven't adhered to those protocols. Um, so, you know, there is something to be said for that. Then there's also the further argument, if I'm to be completely honest with you, Nancy, because you've asked me to be honest, that it does seem, I'm not a public health expert, but I try to read a lot, and it does seem that even though our infections are quite high in this part of the world, we haven't seen the mortalities and fatalities that they've seen the mortality That's rates right. that they've seen in other parts. And there are all kinds of theories for why, why that is. Africa is a younger population. There's all kinds of theories. I'll leave that to the public health and experts and the doctors. So, you know, you have to balance all of these out. So I do think that space must be created for states and local governments and individual schools to make those decisions. But I do also recognize that it is a risky decision because of what we've seen happen in other parts of the world. Mm. Sim, we just have a few minutes, and let me just chip this in, because the way we are also talking about remote learning or perhaps the hybrid model, if we take a look at it, there are also challenges to these, especially for remote learning. Uh, no one is even talking about our very vulnerable students, for example, special education stu students, students with special needs, students without access to internet, which we talked about, students without devices for learning, transition students, for example, that are students that move from one phase of academic class to another. So how do we handle the challenges of, of some of this? 
also tie it to the fact that our digital mat maturity level is not really as much as, sh as it should be. I could be wrong here. I'm an entrepreneur in the tech sector, so you can <laughs> tell me how far we've gone in terms of our digital maturity and how it impacts the learning system. So two questions in one. Yes, no, I think, um, you know, I'll take the, the second one first. Um, it's clear that we are nowhere near where we should be. Um, they are very... Um, conscious things we can do on the policy side, on the regulation side, that will make us take a leap forward. I, I'm, I am optimistic, though, because, you know, today, um, you know, the use of video over smartphones is much more pronounced. Um, things are better than they were. I think we have to acknowledge that. Because of how much I think the Nigerian people have, you know, suffered and struggled, there is an inbuilt cynicism. But you have to try and see beyond that and see that things are better. It is um, getting more normal to see even a low-income person, like a driver, for instance, um, or the man that mans a gate, watching video on their smartphone. Mm -hmm. So this tells you that the infrastructure and the services are getting better. Are they where we need to be? Not by any means. Um, there are other things also that we need to do, like I've mentioned, including internet access. There are still entire segments of this population that are off the networks. Um, they're just off the networks, and the service quality is really, really bad. Um, so that we need to improve on that. Um, Nigeria really should be much further along in that regard. Um, with regards to special needs, I will just go back to what we said before. Across the board, it is, an, it is a crisis. Um, in education. I personally believe that a lot of our problems, whether that is an infrastructure deficit, whether that is, um, you know, um, failings or shortcomings in our democratic effort, which is getting better, all of these problems, even corruption, if you look at it, one of the common denominators is an absence of education. It's poor human development indices. Um, and we need to do much better. So whether that's special needs, or all of these special, even on the mainstream, it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And things have to be done um, to fix that. Okay, I think I just have a few seconds. My director hasn't spoken to me yet to, to round off. Now, let's talk about the reforms in curriculum very quickly in a few seconds. Do we need reforms in the curriculum? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, India, for instance, just went through a massive overhaul um, and uh, massive curriculum reforms and have now made software coding, has now made software coding um, as part of its core curriculum. By the very fact that the nature of the work environment has changed, that there are job titles now that didn't exist before, digital marketer is a big job segment, even here in Nigeria, that job literally did not exist 15 years ago. Tells you that we need to improve things. Um, the curriculum could be much more robust. There was a time I think we could really pat ourselves on the back and say that a Nigerian kid who has finished SS3 mathematics would go into okay. the United States and outperform a child there. Okay. We can't really say that anymore. So the curriculum absolutely needs, needs reform to, to catch up with where the job market is, the skills needed in this 21st century, um, uh, the skills that are called for. We need to really rethink that. And it needs to be an ongoing exercise, yes. I think. I want to say many thanks, Sim, for joining us on today's edition of the program and bringing in your perspectives on what we need to do for the learning sector or the educational sector to thrive. Thank you, Sim. Thanks for having me, Nancy. All right. I've been speaking with Sim Shagai, who is the founder of You Lesson. He's also the founder. Oh, yes, he is the founder and the former CEO of uh, Conga. That's the much we can take on today's edition of the program. I hope... Uh, you are happy with your time investment today? Please join us again tomorrow for another edition. I am Nancy Naji. Don't forget to be the best version of yourselves and keep safe. <laughs>